And um, then it looks like um, is it Michelle's going to be our recorder for the day, or at least first portion, it sounds like. Uh, yes, I will be here for the entire meeting, Chair Yerusha. OK. Um, so if you could just start by going doing a, a roll call con to confirm both who's here and that we can actually hear everybody. Sure, we'll do a call to order. I'll do. Yep, I'll do a roll call and I'll start with uh, Chair Russo. Yep. Uh, Dillenberg. Here. Moeller. Here. Yang. Uh, let's see, uh, Brown. Here. Paisho. Uh, Pykel's here. Pykel, uh, got you, Jeremy Pykel. Uh, let's see, Celeste uh, Harris. Taylor. Kamiri. This is Todd Kemery. Kemery. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So easily have our quorum, it looks like. <clears throat> so uh, first up, then we'll have uh, approval of our agenda. We can do that as a consensus basis. Uh, let's just give a moment if there's anybody that needs to uh, add anything or change anything on our agenda. All right, hearing nothing, it sounds like our agenda can be approved by consensus and we'll move to approval of minutes from December 2nd. For that, we will take a motion and second from members who were present for that meeting. This is Todd Kemery. I'll make the motion. Okay, we have a motion from Todd to accept as presented. Uh, is there a second for that? This is Dillenberg. I second that. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Do we have any corrections to the minutes? Okay, hey, hearing none, we'll go ahead and vote for approval of minutes as presented, and we'll do another roll call for that. Uh, yes, Chair Yerusso, and I will start with you, Tony Yerusso. Hi. Monica Dillenberg. Hi. Robert Moeller. Hi. Kana Yang. Asada Brown. Hi. Jeremy Peichel. Hi. Cecily Harris. Anthony Taylor, Todd Camery. Aye. Thank you. Okay, that is approved. Thank you, everybody. That brings us to the public invitation portion of our meeting, uh, where we're having people pre-register by email. Staff, has anybody reached out for this month? To my knowledge, uh, Chair, nobody has reached out, so we don't have any requests. Okay. Sounds good. Then we'll move on to our business item, uh, which is for the North Creek Greenway Regional Trail, a Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund grant request uh, for Dakota County. With Jessica Lee presenting. Go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners, and Council Members. My name is Jessica Lee and I'm a senior park planner at the council. Today I'm presenting business item 2022-2, North Creek Greenway Regional Trail Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund for the Rockport property for Dakota County. Next slide, please. The North Creek Greenway Regional Trail is located in Dakota County. The trail is named after North Creek, a tributary of the Vermilion River that connects Egan, Apple Valley, Lakeville, Farmington, and Empire Township. The trail will largely follow North Creek through these communities. Next slide, please. This slide shows the concept plan on the left, which is taken from the master plan and the current status of the trail on the right. The concept plan for this trail 
is a 14-mile regional trail that starts at Lebanon Hills in the city of Egan, connects to the Minnesota Zoo, and then travels south through Apple Valley, Lakeview, Farmington, all the way to Empire Township, connecting to the Vermilion River and Whitetail Woods Regional Park. The first three miles of the trail starting in the north at Lebanon Hills are developed and open for use, as shown by the solid green line in the image on the right. The Rockport property is located further along at the south end of Apple Valley, outlined in red. Next slide, please. The subject property is located in a larger parcel that has been platted for a subdivision called Orchard Place. This larger parcel is outlined in yellow on the image on the left. The trail corridor will meander from the north end of this parcel to the south between two future stormwater ponds, which I'll show you on the next slide. The photos on the right offer views of this larger parcel from the south and the north. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a plat of Orchard Place showing our subject property in yellow, a 30-foot wide trail corridor, also known as Outlot C. This 1.17 acre property has been appraised at $285,000. With appraisal and closing costs, the total acquisition is $289,500. The grant amount of $217,125 will be funded with previous year's Parks and Trails Legacy Fund and Council Match. And of course, Dakota County will provide their 25% match of 72,375. Next slide, please. Our rationale for recommendation is that this acquisition is consistent with the 2040 Regional Parks Policy Plan, the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund appropriation requirements, the North Creek Greenway Regional Trail Master Plan, and Dakota County is within its 1.7 million per fiscal year limit for the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund. Next slide, please. Our recommendation is that the Metropolitan Council approve a grant of up to $217,125 to Dakota County to acquire the 1.17 acre Rockport property, Outlot C, located at Pilot Knob Road and 157th Street West in Apple Valley for the North Creek Greenway Regional Trail. And thank you, I'm happy to take questions and staff from Dakota County are also here for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, do commissioners have questions on this one? Um, I guess one for me would be uh, just scrolling through, looking at the funding source. It sounds like this is coming primarily out of council bonds um is that because of the easements and things on this property or is there something else going on there uh, thank you for the question chair um we're trying to use up old funds still from previous years and so this one is about 154,000 with council match and 62,000 with legacy from previous years um that's yeah, that could change just very slightly, um, but we are trying to use up old funds. And once we've used up all the old funds, we're hoping to go back to that um, ratio of council to state funds that we used to try to meet. Oh, okay. Um, I guess that kind of goes into part of my other, which is kind of more of a procedural comment than on this. Um, it, it's just kind of tough to track the... Uh, the match stuff and the year allocations, the way this is presented. Uh, and that's something I've been talking to Emmett about that we may be modifying through the year to try to get a better eye on which funding elements, you know, not only sources, but years we're tapping into and uh, how much is left in them because that makes more sense in context then. Anyone else have questions? Anyone want to move on to a motion? Any further discussion? This is Todd. I'll go ahead and make the motion to continue on. Okay, so that's a, a motion for the proposed actions from the staff report, I assume. Uh, is there a second for that? I second. Okay. You go. 
Was that from Commissioner Brown, I think? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, any, so oh, I'll read that. So then the motion is that the Metropolitan Council approve a grant of up to $217,125 to Dakota County to acquire the 1.17 acre Rockport property outlot C located at Pilot Knob Road and 157th Street West in Apple Valley for the North Creek Greenway Regional Trail. What discussion do we have on that motion? It is in, in our report here. I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of the, the one uh, minor unusual bit here that we're calling out is that the appraisal is slightly older than our policy calls for. Uh, that's not, I don't think, a problem. We just want to make sure that we're transparent about the fact that it exists uh, as the one thing that was not totally cookie cutter in that approval. So if anyone has any issues with that, we can discuss, but I, it seems fine, especially with the way property values have been going that, that probably works out in our favor. Any further discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. This is Al Singer from Dakota County. And just a clarification, it's outlot B, not outlot C. It's the narrow outlot between A and C. Oh. OK. Jessica, did you catch that? I apologize for labeling that incorrectly. Thanks, Al. <laughs> OK. Um, so then. I'll offer the friendly amendment. Yes. Uh, Todd, are you OK with accepting an amendment to your motion uh, to say a lot B? This is Todd Kemry. I accept the changes that are necessary to make this proper. OK. That should be good. So it is still the 1.17 acre Rockport property, but also labeled as outlot B on that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, we'll proceed with the vote on that uh, modified motion. Go ahead, Michelle. Yes, uh, Chair Russo, and I will start with you, uh, Tony Russo. Aye. Monica Dillenberg. Aye. Robert Moeller. Aye. Tana Yang. Aye. Asada Brown. Aye. Jeremy Peichel? Aye. Uh, Cicely Harris? Aye. Anthony Taylor? Todd Kamari? This is Todd Kamari. I say aye. Thank you, Todd. Okay. So that sounds like that is approved as well. Thank you. We will move on to presentations for our information item about the Regional Parks Bonding Program, fiscal year 2023 project proposals and equity highlights continuing from last month. Go ahead, Jessica. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Again, for the record, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm Senior Park Planner with the Council. I'm here tonight with five agencies to present the second half of the Regional Park System Bonding Programs Fiscal Year 2023 Projects and Equity Highlights. Next slide, please. The purpose of today's presentation is to present the remaining bonding projects for Fiscal Year 23. The agencies have been asked to highlight a project that is designed to advance equitable use of the regional park system. Order, order of presentations will be Scott County, City of Bloomington, Carver County, Dakota County, and Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Next slide, please. 
Um, as a reminder from last month, the Regional Park System Bonding Program is a biennial program funded by the state legislature that supports capital projects such as development, acquisition, and restoration. The council has requested 15 million for fiscal year 23, and will match that amount with 10 million in council funds. The funds are allocated to the implementing agencies based on a formula defined in the 2040 Parks Policy Plan. Next slide, please. To prepare for this year's legislative session, the agencies have submitted a list of their potential projects, which you can find in the information item report. These projects are subject to change due to the final funding allocations and appropriation language that authorizes the agency boards to select their projects. Um, again, the agencies were asked to identify which projects on their list are designed to advance equitable use, and now we'll hear from them. Uh, next slide, please. And Scott County, if you are ready to go, you can just jump in and introduce yourself. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alyssa Delgado. I'm the Parks and Natural Resources Coordinator with Scott County, and I will be sharing this um, our project this evening on behalf of Scott County. Um, the um, project is a really long title, and there's a shortened one on the next slide, but I did want to highlight that this project's equity focus, um, the areas are accessibility, age, and race. Next slide, please. So I'm super excited to be able to share um, more about our phase one development for the Lakeside Group Camp at Cedar Lake Farm Regional Park um, in Scott County. If you're unfamiliar with this regional park, it is um, highlighted in the image to the left in the smaller image showing where in Scott County it is, but it is close to the New Prague area. Um, the park lies just on the south end of Cedar Lake. Um, and the actual project area that I'm highlighting today is indicated by the star on the map. So this phase one project is designed to develop infrastructure, including a driveway, parking, and trails, um, and a complementary amenity such as a fishing pier, or lakeside picnicking, all of which will serve to support um, future phases of this project that will add group camps, camper cabins, restroom and shower facilities, and a final trail connection to our current open active use area um, in the park which if you're not familiar with Cedar Lake Farm, as you can see, this phase is on directly south and a little bit to the east. And our current most active use area along the lake is just a little bit further west. So this will provide um, connections to that area as well. And so why, why do we want to do this project? Um, well, we want to build upon the rich local history of gatherings and celebrations to the park. Um, the, the local history that we know about this area is that it has been an important um, gathering and um, celebration space for over 100 years um, along the lakeshore of Cedar Lake Farm. And to continue to maximize the potential of this really unique and recreational area, we want to be able to improve and add amenities that will help serve um, our future generations and help serve continued use, especially as our populations continue to grow. We also want to connect park users to the native forest and to more lakeside recreation. Uh, we know that lakeside recreation is um, immensely popular and especially at this location, um, it is one of the more popular ways to enjoy this particular park. And while we do have some trails that help explore some of the northern end forests, um, this particular project will help uh, park visitors explore the um, remnant maple basswood forest um, by incorporating um, these kind of immersive, um, the, the greater project to incorporate immersive camping and um, recreation within that unique setting of the maple basswood forest along the lakeshore. And then in general, we also want to help um, support uh, various recreational interests and especially interests that can support multi-generational activities um, for our growing and diversifying area. Next slide. So I mentioned at the beginning, our three equity highlight areas um, are accessibility, age, and race. And I'm just gonna touch a little bit on how the greater project that this phase one um, is working towards will um, help address those equity areas. So the, the greater project will incorporate accessible tent pads and sites, a fishing pier, restroom and group um, reservation facilities. And as I mentioned earlier, there will be increased accessible trail connections to the rest of the park. Um, right now at Cedar Lake Farm, this is limited, um, so this project will be greatly improving um, those accessible connections. 
Um, for age, I touched on this a little bit as well, but this um, project, this phase one will be supporting the project that will help um, encourage multi-generational use. And from our research, we know that um, camping and um, lakeside and lakeside recreation activities like fishing and canoe kayaking really encourage multi-generational use. So we want to keep um, keep those recreational opportunities um, available. And then finally, for our race category, um, as I was mentioning too, so they are supporting multi-generational activities that we have found to be popular within um, the greater BIPOC communities. Um, but we also have, um, we also are aware that camping um, and group camping are in, becoming increasingly popular in Hispanic and Black and Asian communities. And we wanna make sure that we have um, increased opportunities to complete this recreational activity at Cedar Lake Farm. There really isn't currently great, um, a great wealth of camping opportunities, but this, um, this phase one, they'll help support the infrastructure um, for us to be able to add these amenities. Um, we hope will help create a more inclusive and exciting place for individuals in and around Scott County to recreate in that way as well. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time and I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you. And any commissioner questions for this one? This is Todd Kimmery. Yes, Todd. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's more, it's not so much a uh, question, but a comment. Um, I was going to ask about the uh, US Access Board, but with the plans for accessible temp pads and sites and and such, uh, I really don't need to ask if if you need if Scott County knows about this particular government body. But uh, and I, I want to commend uh, Scott County on their uh, insight and uh, foresight to uh, include some of the things that people really don't know about as far as the sense uh, accessibility. So I have used accessible tent pads before. And they are really convenient for uh, being able to keep the inventory of of things to bring along camping. So, uh, just a, a quick uh, appreciation for what Sky County is doing. Thank you, Chair. All right, thanks, Todd. Anyone else? All right, thank you, Alyssa, and we'll move on. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. This is Renee Clark, Assistant Director of Parks and Park Projects for the City of Bloomington. Bloomington owns and manages a portion of the Highland Bush Anderson Regional Park together with the Three Rivers Park District, and that's located in the western portion of the city. This biennium, we've requested bonding funds for improvements at two important park units, Normandale Lake, and Bush Lake Beach site improvements. Next slide, please. Tonight, I'd like to quickly highlight Bush Lake Beach. This site is one of the more popular units at the Highland uh, Bush Anderson Park, um, very important to the city of Bloomington. Site improvements include playground replacement and um, a, a well-needed restroom remodel to improve accessibility. With that, I'll take any questions. All right. Anyone have questions for Bloomington? Hi, um, this is Monica Dienenberg. I have a question for the playground replacement. Is um, are they planning to replace both all the playgrounds on the picture, or just I guess it as a swing set? So a new playground there would in likely incorporate um, swings with a play structure in a single container. There are actually, um, I believe, three playgrounds at, at, this, at this site, which are all um, 10, 10 years or older and in need of replacement. And the, the designs would actually be informed by community participation, but typical construction would combine those things in a container. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Uh, this is Todd Kimmery. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a question then for Bloomington. 
Um, your last answer uh, makes me want to ask about the accessibility plague areas. Are they are the ADA uh, compliant, or are you going to? I guess what confused me was that it was going to be public participation. I'm just wondering if Bloomington uh, is aware of there are uh, play areas that are designed for all inclusion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kemry, for the for that question. Um, Bloomington does not have a fully inclusive playground in its city. Um, most of the city of Bloomington is outside the regional system. We are planning um, fully inclusive facilities um, to have, have at least two of those in the city. I don't believe that the um, replacement of the playgrounds at Highland, um, particularly at Bush Lake Beach, would be fully inclusive, but have a um, portion of um, increased handicap accessibility. The public participation is um, really involving users in the design choices, the um, play equipment that's selected. And then um, you can tell by looking at these pictures, there, um, the, the actual accessibility for somebody in a wheelchair or um, with mobility issues to get to these sites is very limited um, by, um, by the grass and access. So um, sidewalk and leading up to and around a new playground would be part of a new design um, along with um, more accessible equipment and surfacing. Uh, so uh, just to clarify, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little, my brain is a little on uh, uh, behind mode to, today. So uh, you're saying then accessibility or all-inclusive uh, play equipment for the Bush Lake Beach Improvement Project, uh, you're going to hold off on that? No. Part um, One of the things that we are planning um, at at Bush Lake Beach, our playground replacements, those playground replacements will include increased um, handicap accessibility, um, including how to access the containers themselves and the equipment that's used. Thank you, Renee, uh, Ms. Clark. I, I appreciate the clarification on that. Sorry for my misunderstanding. Thank, Thank you very you much. Pastor. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Renee. We'll move on to the next one. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the Parks and Open Space Commission. This is Marty Walsh, Carver County Parks and Recreation Director. Carver County is in the process of developing Lake Waconia Regional Park, um, which is located on the second largest lake in the metropolitan area. Key to the development of this park is our request to fund a new waterfront service center building, which is shown here. The service center building will um, provide restrooms, picnic pavilion, offer rental services for self-propelled watercraft, winter recreation equipment, indoor, event, classroom, and social gathering space. This work is a part of phase two development of the park. The building will utilize previous approved state bonds uh, for the building itself and previously invested funds for site grading, roads, parking lot, sewer, and water service. The building will make accessible to all abilities the basic necessities of restrooms for over a thousand annual park visitors while providing other services that will enhance the user satisfaction for this developing part. Um, this is key to providing timely and sequential development for this park and is key to delivering effective park service. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd stand for questions. Okay, thank you. Anyone have questions for Marty? Yeah. I'm not sure if I heard something. 
I think that was Cecily, Chair. Possibly. Cecily, do you have a question? I do. Um, okay. <clears throat> and it's on the slide that is on page 10 of the handout. It, you know, the building looks lovely and it sounds like a great project, but the perspective of the slide troubles me. So is it taken from the beach? Uh, Mr. Chair and Cecily, yes, the perspective here that is shown is from the beach perspective. So in the foreground is the, the beginnings of the dock structure, which lead up to the building from the lakeside. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So, you know, as you head from the beach down that pathway, on the right side, is that just an overlook? On the right side, yes, that is a, uh, a slightly elevated overlook that is, at this point, conceptually designed. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, thanks, Marty. We'll move on. Chair, I was just going to alert you to um, Anthony Taylor has been trying to get in. I don't know if he's in yet, but he switched computers and so he's still trying. I just wanted to alert the commission. Okay. Um, I think we can skip this slide, please. Yes. I don't know who has slide control. There we go. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I'm Jeff Bransford. I'm with Dakota County. I'm the Parks Administrative Manager, and it's my pleasure to spend a few moments telling you a little bit about our request for uh, Spring Lake Park Reserve Master Plan improvements. You might remember that Spring Lake Park Reserve is situated along the Mississippi River in Dakota County between Rosemount and Hastings. And it's a very special place, uh, not only for its amazing river views and access and abundant wildlife, but also for its rare ecosystem and especially for its historical and cultural significance to the county and to the region and to the state. Um, research and archaeology have shown that People have called this area home for millennia. And still today, land within Spring Lake Park Reserve is considered sacred uh, to many First Nations. This park includes places where the Dakota people lived and prayed and buried their relatives. And it is important to acknowledge that this land is significant to past generations present generations and future generations of Dakota people. And really to recognize that these places surround us all every day, especially here in the Twin Cities. So some of this may sound familiar to you because the commission considered the Spring Lake Park Reserve Master Plan uh, just recently, a few months ago at your November meeting. Thank you for that. So this request is for funding to put the initial phases of the master plan into motion. That plan has the overarching goal of balancing stewardship with education and access at this park. Um, it recognizes, this project recognizes that the sites within the park and the stories um, that this park has generated must be connected. Um, especially ideas that this is a Dakota place. There is a relationship between the land and the native flora and fauna and the Mississippi River and the Dakota people. Um, also that ecology and human history are tied and that ecological diversity and human diversity should be understood together. These are larger social themes that truly come to life at this park. Um, it is a place for gathering and our proposed improvements uh, recognize that. I just noticed that maybe you can click to the next slide so we can have some images to go along with this. Thank you, and sorry for not catching that earlier. But I wanted to state that the project um, before you would, would do several things. And first of all, it would protect the sensitive cultural and natural resources uh, that are present in this park. 
including reintroducing a keystone species, bison, to help restore the prairie and also to help uh, tell the story of that connection between land and people. The project would also create additional places for people to get to the river, enjoy the river, and learn from it, to improve trails throughout the park, to provide access to the right places in the park in the right way, and to offer interpretation of those areas, uh, to provide places for people to gather, uh, to celebrate, to reflect, and hold events. And um, last but not least, this project would not build these physical things necessarily, but also continue to build a collaborative relationship between the county um, and indigenous communities uh, regarding decision making about the park and future operations of the park. So that's all I have to say about this re request, our one and only request, um, which would be to use this two and a half million dollar allocation in the most meaningful way possible advancing not only the protection of the land and water at Spring Lake Park Reserve, but also attempting to, humbly attempting to provide a more respectful and equitable approach to stewardship of these park resources. And with that, I'm happy to stay in for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, what do we have as questions for Dakota County? Hey, this is Anthony, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks very much. Can you can you talk a little bit about your plans relative to a shift in terms of the interpretive language or an interpretive center or something very specific to the indigenous community? I mean, you spoke about it a lot. Your tone is incredibly solemn and respectful. And so, um, is there a way that we will see this in the new language and interpretation for the land and? And even the reintroduction of bison, like from what I understand, it actually sounds really cool because this is actually a uh, strategy around um, ecological preservation, right? I mean, it's not just like we want bison on the land. This relates to questions of how indigenous communities managed with fire, managed with grazing. I mean, so anyway, I, I just I, I think that that's pretty, and that's what I understand to be the case. And I, <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but is there a way where you are actively looking at and have a plan and maybe you can share with us some of the ways that we'll see that in the new interpretation that happens there? And this is a great project, by the way, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, thank you for the question. Um, we certainly seek to go beyond the traditional and conventional way of delivering interpretation in this park. Um, not that that hasn't been effective in the past, but there are certainly ways to be more effective and more respectful with interpretation moving forward, especially at a special place like this. Um, we desire to create the interpretive messages and the interpretive content with indigenous cultures, uh, with, with indigenous people. We've engaged the uh, tribal historic preservation officers in the development of our master plan. Um, and we also developed an interpretive plan specifically uh, within our master plan um, in conjunction with those TIPOs to tell the right stories in the right way. Um, we hope that this goes beyond just interpretive panels at trailheads or at observation areas. But to, yes, touch on those those things uh, throughout the park and create a story. Um, specifically, uh, I, I referenced some of the interpretive themes in 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 my comments here. But the overarching theme is that um, human history and ecology are tied. Um, the way that we manage resources shape uh, our society and vice versa. And so there are many variations upon that theme that we hope to. Uh, build upon throughout the park. And I would be happy to provide to you and the commission um, a copy of our interpretive plan, which goes into more detail about those specific messages and the preliminary conceptual thinking about where those messages would be told and how within our plan. I could say more, but maybe I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, I would love it if you share that plan. And um, can you speak to the the social interpretation as well i mean is there an aspect of that and have you also as you work with those communities 
um, one of the groups I think that is the most um, socially revolutionary right now around interpretation. That, you know, that I know the American Indian Movement Interpretive Center is kind of really relaunched. And I don't, is there, have you had any kind of communication with them possibly? Um, but again, I'm also interested in social interpretation as well, because I, I think the ecological part will get right. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, um, I'm not certain if we've had contact with that specific group that you mentioned. I'd have to go back and check our files for that. Um, but in terms of social interpretation, I, I think so. Um, that may warrant a, a, a another conversation with you about um, exactly what that means and how we can get that right. But our attempt here is to recognize that um, throughout history, the different people that have um, inhabited the Spring Lake Park Reserve area or benefited from it um, have contributed to the land in different ways. And we have a responsibility to understand those past uses, keep the things that have worked and discard what hasn't and that can be uh, that can come to light through how we consume natural resources how we recreate in spaces how we use and appreciate the river so that may warrant a, a more uh, in-depth conversation if if you're willing and i'm more than happy to share the plan to the commission as well okay uh, any other questions for Joe? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Jeff, and we'll move on. Sorry, everyone. Adam Arvidson is here, and for some reason, I cannot get my video to start um, with this. So rather than um, make you wait for me to do that, you'll just have to uh, hear my voice. And I, I've been in front of this group a few times, so maybe you can visualize me in whatever way <laughs> you feel is appropriate. Um, I'm the director of strategic planning for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk about the five projects that we have uh, lined up uh, for this request. Um, these five projects um, are pretty heavy on investment in North Minneapolis, um, and then also an investment in the most visited regional park um, in the metro area. And before I list what they are on the slide in front of you there, I do wanna say really quickly that um, when it comes to um, equity focus areas with uh, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, um, I want to put this in kind of an overarching context in that all of these projects, um, uh, when they come to you out of our own capital improvement plan, uh, were selected based on equity metrics that we use to prioritize projects. So every year we score all 19 of our regional park facilities on a series of equity metrics. And uh, the parks that have the highest scores are the ones that are next in line for investment. So when you look at parks um, like uh, the Loose Line, which I will highlight on my next slide as the equity highlight, um, the Shingle Creek Master Plan Implementation, Victory Worth Parkways, Trail and Environmental Improvements, above the Falls Regional Park and the Upper Harbor Terminal implementation, and then also Minneapolis Chain of Lakes. Um, all of these parks uh, have very high equity rankings in our system. The first four um, are on our equity list largely because they have lacked historic investment. I think we can go back a long time and not find an example of us bringing forward bonding projects for these four parks uh, to you in recent memory, perhaps with the exception of above the falls where we have asked for funding for Graco Park and for other land acquisitions. But Victory Worth, Shingle Creek, and Loose Line, which all pass through the north side of Minneapolis, have not had investment uh, from the regional park funds in quite a long time. So that's why they are here in front of you. Specifically with regard to the Loose Line, um, it's about um, actually acquiring a new trail corridor and then beginning to implement that trail according to the master plan. 
Shingle Creek is kind of a lesser known, some people call it the Minnehaha Creek of the North. We'd actually like to make it into the Minnehaha Creek of the North, which means new amenities, trails, bridges, wayfinding, comfort facilities, and also significant enhancement of the riparian habitat. Shingle Creek is basically a ditch that was dug in order to allow North Minneapolis to become developable. And we want that ditch to become something that we can be proud of and that also the ducks and birds and owls and insects can be proud of. Victory uh, Worth Parkways are both um, a bit more formal um, park spaces than Shingle Creek. Um, but in addition, it's time for us to do another round of trail improvements, neighborhood connections, improved wayfinding, and also environmental enhancements, even amidst the formal grid of trees um, there at Victory Park. Upper Harbor Terminal Park has been much in the news of late. The Park Board is moving forward with implementation of that park after recent approval of a concept plan by our Board of Commissioners. Um, the vision for that park is to do an incremental improvement approach that engages the community consistently over time and on into the future as the neighborhood develops around Upper Harbor Terminal in order to make sure that we get the facility mix right. So this first which matches um, a state GO bond that was provided generously to us by the legislature, does help with the acquisition, cleanup of the parkland, shoreline restoration, removal of some of the existing industrial infrastructure, as well as a variety of amenities that allow flexible use in this park while we're um, uh, waiting for the neighbors to essentially take up residence nearby. And then lastly, the Minneapolis chain of lakes, there's five lakes, there's a lot to do. We always have trail and amenity, play area, wayfinding, and environmental enhancements to take care of. Um, and in addition, the master plan for Chain of Lakes does show a significant reduction in the amount of pavement in favor of natural green areas that help protect our lakes from stormwater runoff. I expect some of those projects will be involved in this particular request as well. If you can go to the next slide, I wanna talk a bit more about the loose line and then I'll stand for questions. And I still cannot get my camera working. My computer says that another program is using it. So I hope someone else isn't watching me right now and do this presentation completely mystified by what's going on. So the Loose Line Regional Trail um, bridges a significant socioeconomic divide in Minneapolis. On the map there on your right, you can see uh, the red line there is the Loose Line as proposed. The kind of orange line that wiggles all over the place is the existing Loose Line Trail. It is, we believe, currently the least legible, least safe regional trail, certainly in Minneapolis and possibly in the whole region. Um, you actually have to get on roads um, and mix with traffic two separate times in order to uh, move the length of the loose line in Minneapolis. Um, so on, on one side of that red line to the north is North Minneapolis and to the south and west of that line is the Bryn Mawr neighborhood and the beginning of South Minneapolis. So when we did the master plan for this, we convened people from both sides of that divide, which interestingly is a commissioner district, city council member divide, and also the place where the streets with the south addresses change to the streets with the north addresses. So this creek is carrying a lot of historical baggage, and we brought people together from both sides of that line to envision the Bassett Creek Valley together. And one of the things they told us was that having a legible, consistent, non-road-based regional trail that connected to both neighborhoods in turn as it moved through them would actually help link the north and south sides together in a way that had not been, frankly, in a way that has been deliberately separated for about 100 years. In order to do that, we are working with the Trust for Public Land, both on acquisition and actually on a study where we are looking at the potential for gentrification and displacement and trying to develop strategies so that this improvement and other neighborhood park improvements in the areas do not negatively impact the neighborhoods they are meant to serve. Harrison neighborhood, just north of the trail, was identified by the University of Minnesota as having one of the highest threats of gentrification in the entire city. Putting millions of dollars into park improvements in that area is not the sole reason for just gentrification and displacement, but it can contribute to that. So we wanna be very careful as we develop this so as we work toward acquisition, we are collaborating with the Trust for Public Land and possibly the Metro Council as they develop light rail plans in the area to 
to understand what policies we can implement in advance to protect these neighborhoods. And most interestingly, completion of this segment of the loose line will actually create a trail loop in North Minneapolis. Somewhat shockingly, Minneapolis, though known for its grand rounds and all of its trail loops, there is not a single pedestrian bicycle trail loop that exists in North Minneapolis. You cannot circle around in North Minneapolis on trails without getting onto roads. We're very close in some areas, especially at the 26th Avenue overlook on the river, um, but the loose line here, this new routing uh, would allow us to accomplish that. Um, and by that, I mean a safe off-road loop that people expect to have with regional trail systems. So with that, it's a bit of an overview for the loose line and I will stand for questions and I would really love to get my camera going, uh, but we may, we may not, that may not be in the cards tonight. Chair Yeruso, I turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Adam. Uh, for commissioners who have been with us for a while, I think you may recall uh, Linnea talking about this when we looked at a, a master plan a while back, because this was kind of her home turf uh, and talking about some of those historical connections that were designed to be broken at that spot. So this goes uh, back to some of those conversations we had a few years ago there. Uh, any questions for Minneapolis Park Board here? All right, well, I guess hearing none, we, we do probably know what you look like by now, but thank you, Adam, for trying, and we'll move on. Thanks, everyone. I think that'll do it for tonight. I, I just want to thank all the agencies for being here and for presenting. Indeed, thank you. Uh, one procedural question, Jessica, just to make sure, I think I asked this last time too, uh, to make sure I'm tracking what we're doing here. We're getting these proposals earlier in the process than historically to get to be able to spend some time talking about them. Uh, but since this is going in with our request to the legislature, what will happen is after legislative session when we know what a dollar amount they actually approved, we'll get back an actual business item uh, for the grants for these again later, right? Uh, yes, Chair, I think that's correct. It might come in the form of a budget amendment. Um, but the, yeah, the grants will be submitted in web grants with final amounts and all the details after the uh, um, allocations are received. Is that something that um, we would probably be getting at whatever, you know, a, a meeting shortly after a uh, legislative session deals with that? Or would that probably be in like a July with fiscal year kind of timing? Um, I would have to guess July, but I don't know the details of the budget amendments. Okay. Well, I mean, and, and I, I don't know what the budget amendment process itself looks like. I, I'm just thinking from, I don't know if those come through us as their own thing or what, but we, we have to see the grant somehow, uh, even if it's kind of wrapped into something else. Yeah, Chair, I, I believe um, in recent years we've started uh, specifying the grants through a budget, uh, budget amendment, um, but maybe Emmett has more information on that. Tony, let me talk to Jessica and we will get back to you and the commissioners as we move forward, because I, I, I agree with Jessica that it'll come at least in the form of a budget amendment, and that budget amendment now does delineate the different grants. So. I think that answers your question, Tony, but I'd like to go offline and come back with it. Okay. I just okay. wanted to re remind you that um, procedurally, we, we do need it to come through MPOSC as a business item, even if it's kind of being handled at a financial level as something else, because it is uh, ultimately a, a grant for regional parks that were required to review uh, as, a, as an actual action in addition to our information items. Got it. Thank you. That's all I was bringing that up. I know we've had a little bit of confusion on that some years, so it's a little funny. All right. Uh, anybody else have wrapping up questions or comments on that generally? All right. Thank you, Jessica, for all of that. So that brings us then to our reports. Um, 
I don't think I have any reports this month. Are there any commissioner reports? Tony, it's this like is Jeremy. Jeremy. I have something brief. Okay, go ahead, Jeremy. And I may have heard someone else after you as well. Okay. I apologize, whoever I stepped on there. Uh, but I wanted to just offer that um, in my role on the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, last year uh, we were unable to come to a supermajority on our recommendation to the legislature for projects for the upcoming grant year. Uh, so there, the leg we have another meeting coming up in January and February timeframe where we could potentially come up with something to propose to the legislature, but it, it looks doubtful. So I would suspect that we'll be in another position where the committees in the legislature will be deciding how LCCMR funds are allocated, which may delay how those funds get to uh, the Met Council and projects that have been proposed. So I'll offer um, that and don't have anything else. Thanks. Right. Thank you. No, it's good to know. Who else was trying to talk there? That was me, Chair. I was just oh. wanting to let you know that Jeremy had his hand raised. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Any other commissioners? All right, then staff reports. Um, Chair and commissioners, I just have uh, three short reports. Uh, the first is I just wanted to thank uh, Michelle Wenner again for stepping up as our recording secretary uh, for tonight's meeting. Um, Sandy Dingle is out on medical leave. Um, please keep her in your thoughts and um, she will be back hopefully very soon. So I wanted to, to just acknowledge that. Um, the next thing is, uh, and and Tony, this is nothing new to you, but it looks like we're going to be in this remote uh, arrangement for uh, a little while. Um, our chair uh, hasn't, he's not indicated that this arrangement will be eased anytime soon. I don't think there's even a date set right now, uh, but I just wanted to let commissioners know that we're monitoring it closely. We talk about it regularly and um, as soon as it is safe to return to in-person meetings, we will. Um, so that's all I have for that. Um, and then finally, um, this is perhaps hopeful to the point of foolishness. Uh, so we've we've scheduled and canceled the Bedote tour. That's the sacred sites tour for this commission and our uh, park agencies uh, three times. And um, well, we're going to do it a fourth. And um, I talked to our director, Lisa Barajas, and she's like, Emmett, push it back to midsummer. So we're kind of looking June, July um, for uh, the rescheduling of the Bedote tour, hoping for uh, better times ahead. And um, the, the historical center that we're working with, or the meet, Minnesota Humanities Center, excuse me, that that sponsors and arranges this has put uh, COVID protocols into place. So we will only do it if it's safe, but it no longer is a bus tour where they there's they feed you like the sous chef actually used to be one of the caterers they used. Um, we will each need to bring our own paper bag lunches, but it's going to be a great tour and it um, will be, it'll start at Fort Snelling and it will end at Indian Mounds Regional Park. So the state park to the regional park, um, Minneapolis unincorporated area <laughs> to St. Paul. So it's going to be great and uh, stay tuned. We will get you the date as soon as we um, can. It'll be either a Friday or a Monday, I think. And I'm leaning toward preferring Friday, just thinking it might work better for people's calendars. If that is incorrect, feel free to shoot me a message or say something now. So thanks everyone. And uh, thank you again for sustaining our Parks and Open Space Commission in this time um, online. I know it's not easy. Um, I also wanted to just acknowledge our council member, uh, Sue Vento, who's online and a regular partner with me in, in the parks work on the council. So thank you. All right. well, thank you, Emmett. Uh, Sue, do you have anything to add to that? Just happy new year. I hope everybody's 
staying warm and healthy. It's a challenge. <laughs> thank you. Indeed. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, with that, then, I believe we are ready to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, all, everyone. Have a great um, January. Stay warm. You bye do. Bye. I see you.